This weekend is the Maker Central show at the NEC, the 30th of April and the 1st of May, and I'm going to be there on stand C13. So going along the Maker's theme, I thought this week I've got to make something. So I'm going to show you how I made this really nice outdoor coffee table that anyone can do with any tools. <laughs> So I'm just spending a few minutes relaxing in the garden before I get in the car to go off to the NEC. So go and see the worker in the garage and he'll show you how to make this coffee table. Nice. Well that's very nice isn't it, sitting there relaxing with an orange juice. While some of us are indoors working, I don't know. Anyway, today's project of this outdoor coffee table is I think a really nice project that will come in useful over the summer. And I've designed it so it can be made by any level of DIY with the most basic of the tools. So today you'll actually see me making this with the most basic tools I have in the workshop. So if you do own some power tools like mitre saws and cordless drills, it's only gonna make this project even easier. If you're interested in having a look at the plans for this, you'll find them at my Etsy store with all the cut lists and tips and tricks and everything you need to make this as easy as possible. I'll put a link in the description below. So the style of this coffee table, I want to match the concrete top table that I made this time last year. So it needs to have chunky legs and a concrete top. So the frame is made out of just two pieces of eight foot long treated timber. The first one is a three by three that planes down to 60 by 60 or two and a half by two and a half inches. And this is actually a fence post that I found nice and square and nice and straight out the DIY shop. And the bracing I'm gonna make out of a CLS C16 three by two, which you can get really in any DIY shop these days. Now it's important that both of these are treated and it's just gonna last longer out in the rain and the sun. Now last year when I made the concrete top table, I realized that the making the concrete top was quite a challenging part of that project. And it takes some time and unless you really know what you're doing with concrete can be a little bit challenging. So this project I've designed around something a lot easier to end up with the same result. So I've designed it around a concrete paving slab. So this is going to be the top of my table. And this is something you can buy at any DIY shop. I bought this for about five pound. I've got it in the charcoal color that matches my other table. And it's about 450 square, which is about 16 inches square. So on this project, there's no need for pouring any concrete. It's already been done for you. So all we have to do is make the frame and stick it on the top. And then we've got a nice coffee table. So I think it's time that we started cutting some timber. It's a good idea to firstly take a small cut near the end of the timber to make sure it's square. And sometimes you find the shop ball end grain can be a little bit open. So start with a fresh cut. If you have a square and a pencil, then mark all the way around the perimeter. If you don't, you can do what I'm doing here, which is wrapping a piece of paper around the timber so it lines up with itself, and then cutting accurately around it. This will ensure that the cut is square. Obviously, if you have a mitre saw, then this will be quicker and more accurate if you've adjusted it properly. But today it's hand tools all the way for me. So this tenant saw is what I'm using. I carry on and cut all four 450 millimeter long legs from this single eight foot piece.
I cut the cross members in exactly the same way from one piece of 3 by 2 and give the ends a quick sand just to remove any splinters. That's all the timber now cut to size. And before I do anything else, I like at this point just to decide on the main legs which faces are going to be facing out, which ones are you going to see mostly, and which ones are going to be facing into the middle of the table, ones that you don't really, can't really see. So just having a look at the quality of each side, seeing if there's any nasty knots or whatever. The other thing you find on timber like this, it's not really tightly grained. There's always generally one side that seems to be quite rough. So that's one of the sides that's definitely going to be facing in. And then I just need to pick one of the other sides that goes with it and I've got a great big knot here as well. So these are the two sides that I've picked are going to be facing into the table and these are the two facing out. So all I'm going to do is put an arrow there just to show that these are facing into the table. The other thing I'm going to do while I'm at it is decide which is going to be top and bottom. There's not really much difference so I'm going to just put this as a top. So that means that we know the orientation of those, we don't have to think about it again. Now the fixings I'm using today are these big screw type fixings and these are 100 millimeter long Torx type fixing, that's TX. They've got a star type bit that goes into your drill driver to force them in. But you can actually use an Allen key on these as well. They come in different colours. I prefer the black one which tends to stand out against the timber colour but they do do them in this sort of gold as well. The other thing we're going to have to have a little bit of a think about is at the top of each leg we're going to have this sort of arrangement. If you can imagine this is upside down so this is the foot and this is the top. And I'm going to have two fixings coming through the post here into this piece of timber and two fixings coming through the post here into this piece of timber. And if they all come through at the same level, they're going to conflict with each other right in the middle of this piece of timber and they're not going to be able to want to pass. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to stagger them slightly so they miss each other and they can go into these pieces of timber. Now the best way of doing that is to make a template so we know exactly where we're marking on each side of this post. And it also means that we can get the positions of the fixings exactly the same on each leg as well. And it makes it look as if you've thought about the project. The last thing we really want to do at this stage is to have fixings going in in random positions because it looks like you've just panicked and tried to get a screw in to make it secure. So we're going to get a bit of cardboard and I'm going to show you how to make a template. Templates and jigs are a really good way to ensure exact repetitive cuts, holes or fixings. I just cut a piece of cardboard the same size as the leg. I roughly tear off one end so I won't mix up which end should be aligned with the top of the leg and then draw a centre line down the middle. I mark the depth of my cross member on the template, measure it and then divide that length by 5. And then I mark these positions on the template, that's 13 millimetres, 26, 39 etc. And then make some holes at that point and number them. With this template now aligned to the top of the leg, I can use it to mark the 1 and 3 point on one side, and the 2 and 4 point on the other. I do this for all four legs. For the bottom cross pieces, I decide which pair of legs they're going to support and then mark these on the top so I don't get mixed up. I modify the template by cutting a touch off the end so I can use it to mark out the holes on these bottom pieces that will have exactly the same spacing as the top but now in the centre of each. 
I used my very first thin offcut from the leg timber to use as a spacer from the bottom of the leg. So I end up with a consistent position on each one for the fixings. So good, after a couple of minutes of marking out, that's all my holes now marked. And that's the great thing about using a jig or a template, is you put the time and effort into making the jig or the template, and then once you've made it, you just have to hold it in the right position and mark. And it's a lot quicker after that, and it's also more consistent because you can't go wrong. There's nothing like having to keep measuring and keep remembering what measurements you've got. And that's definitely a good way of going wrong. So what I've ended up with is either upper holes or lower holes. But what I've done is I've done, I've, I've done it in such a way that it's the same on each side. So let me see if I can describe what I mean. These two are upper, these two are lower, and then upper and then lower. So if you look at any particular side, you'll see the double holes either slightly up or slightly down rather than all on the skew as well. Also what I've done is I've marked out the lower holes where I've got a cross piece going from one side to another and I've done that on both sides as well. So everything's marked so we now need to start doing some drilling and as I said to you right at the beginning I'm going to be using some really basic tools on this project and they don't come more basic than this so we have to go back many many years to the days when people drilled by hand. You know, this is completely possible. And obviously the way that it was always done before everyone had power tools. And to be honest with you, it's only taken me five minutes to do this. But the problem with a hand drill is that all your effort goes into actually doing the drilling rather than making it accurate and vertical. So although it's completely possible, if you do have a cordless drill, now's the time to definitely use it. And if you don't have a cordless drill and you're new to DIY, I would highly recommend investing in one as your first purchase because you can drill with it, use it as a screwdriver, you'll come across all kinds of uses for it. Have a go and have a look at my first power tool video. But I've said I'm going to do this and I'm going to get through all of these holes without using my DeWalt even if it kills me. Blimey. Laying out the legs upside down, I use a 10 millimeter piece of scrap as a spacer to offset the cross pieces from the front face of each leg, and then hammer in my drill to make a mark on the end of the treba two where I'm going to drill a small pilot hole for the fixing. A pilot hole isn't normally required at this point, but it does make screwing into the piece easier and more accurate, especially if you're not using power tools. And then it's just a matter of screwing everything together, just like putting together flat pack furniture.
So with this last cross member going in at the bottom here, the timber work is finished. I don't actually think you really need this bottom section, but it does make it look right. So I'm just essentially just finishing it off. Now, some of you might have noticed that I've not sanded this. And if you are going to sand it, definitely the time to do it is before you put it together, because it's a lot easier sanding individual sections rather than waiting to this point and you've got all these corners and whatever. It just makes it a lot harder. But there's two reasons I'm not going to sand this. First of all, this planed timber, even if it's a fence post, is pretty smooth already. It's not perfect, but it's pretty smooth. And secondly, I think for garden furniture, I don't think you need to get down to sort of a fine furniture piece sort of finish. This is the finish I'm going to put on this is like an outdoor furniture finish. And I want it to be not rough, but a little bit rustic and not completely perfect. And also, I don't really like sanding. So I'm not going to sand this and I don't think anyone will ever notice. So that's all the timber finished. All we have to do now is plonk this onto the uh, paving slab upside down and I'll show you how I'm going to fix it. I've used a 450 millimeter square concrete paving slab for this, but you can use any size or style you want. I would just aim for an inch and a half or 30, 40 mil overhang around each side just to make it look right. I've centered the legs on the paving slab and I've cut a couple of bits of off-cut timber which I'm going to put some construction adhesive on and glue onto the underside of the paving slab in the corner. So that essentially will fix the position of this. However, I can still take it off. So I can be able to take this outside in two parts. We'll then use some more construction adhesive and when it's out there, put it together properly. The only challenge I've got is the construction adhesive I'm using. My nozzle has come off, so I'm going to have to use like a stick thing. The worst thing about these adhesive tubes are, unlike normal sealant tubes, you can't change the nozzles. So they always seem to end up getting blocked and broken with still plenty of material in the tube. So I'm just putting one in each corner and I'm not doing them really tight. I'm just giving them a little bit of wiggle room, maybe half a millimetre or a millimetre. So they're not right tight to the frame. Now they're going to take about 24 hours to really go off properly. And in the meantime, I can remove this and I can stain this with my favourite uh, garden furniture oak stain, which I've used for all the other furniture. So just so it matches. So while this is going off, come back to this tomorrow. I'll finish this. So there it is, fully finished and in use. And I think that's going to last quite some time. The concrete top's not going anywhere. And treated timber like that, as long as you elevate it from the floor, should last a number of years. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please check out the other ones on the channel and please subscribe. And if you're anywhere near the NEC this weekend, please come down and say hello. That reminds me, I better get going.